All right, well, uh, it's really nice to be here. Again, I'm Janet Kilburn, and I am the Vermont point person for the CDC's Learn the Science Act Early campaign, which is um, a public health campaign to make sure that all children are um, identified for developmental and behavioral concerns as soon as possible, and that parents and caregivers have um, information on early childhood development, social emotional development uh, as early as possible so that they are better equipped to advocate on behalf of their child and get extra help for their child. Okay, so these are some of the objectives of um, my section today where I'm sharing with you about the updates to the Learn the Signs milestones. Um, we really want, um, you guys are uh, certainly, I'm preaching to the choir here, but to everybody to recognize that um, children are sometimes not identified early and that I want you to, I'm sure you understand the system of care in Vermont, but we're really trying to do, trying to raise awareness of our system in Vermont and um, what is our early identification and developmental screening system, and then understand these revisions and why they were made. Okay, why monitor development? So um, these are just some national statistics, but um, certainly um, it's pretty concerning that one in four uh, children, can y'all hear me? Is that, um, well, maybe somebody just needs to mute. I think we've just taken care of that. Sorry, Janet. Okay, no worries. Um, that up to one in four um, children are at risk of developmental behavior or social emotional delay. And I'm sure that's even higher now as a result of COVID. And you all are um, working directly with probably some of these kiddos um, with the impact of the social, social isolation and lack of um, social and play opportunities. So um, also one in six children, three to 17 has a developmental disability. And then of course these increasing high um, statistics for autism spectrum disorder. Okay, so here's a graphic of a, of a early identification system, but you see that this top one developmental monitoring is really um, a whole universal whole population approach, very upstream, very prevention oriented. Um, and often a first step before formal developmental screening over here. And Cooper in a minute is gonna tell you more about our Help Me Grow system, but we work um, very, very hard to promote universal developmental screening across early education environments. So that's across medical homes in early care and education settings um, with CIS and also in the family's home through home visiting. And then we have our uh, early intervention system, Part B and Part C, and CIS, and then supports and services, which you all um, are, are part of that network. And of course, diagnostic evaluations are in there as well. So what's the difference between monitoring versus formal screening? So monitoring is really, again, that whole population prevention approach that can be family driven. Um, it can support the need for additional screening it's also called surveillance in medical homes. And the learn the science materials are correlated with each well child visit. So the developmental milestones are written to correspond to the ages for well child visits. And then screening is you, you use a validated screening tool like the ages and stages. Um, it also has milestones, but um, it's based on real research administered by professionals. Um, and it, it helps determine, of course, if further diagnostic um, or uh, evaluations are needed. So these are some of the new materials that the CDC has come out with. They have a new look, new colors. Um, everything has been updated. I'm gonna tell you about the specific updates, but uh, in Vermont, we have some older materials and you may be more familiar with those and it's fine to keep using those until we use them up. But here's the web address if you want to order these new materials. So we have checklists right here, these, these milestone booklets. Um, here's a picture. Here's the older, I don't know if it's blurry for you guys, but the older one that we have in Vermont and we, that's uh, a little blurry. And we customized it um, with Help Me Grow information. I can't really show you, but this has the information that's on the checklist inside of it, but a little more extensive. And then the tracker app. So the tracker app, um, I can't see you all, I wish I could, but I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Learn the Science tracker app, but it is really 
cool. And I would love for you to promote it with your families um, in your workplaces because it's a very dynamic tool that has um, interactive milestone checklists for ages two through five. It has photos and videos demonstrating the milestones, uh, lots of learning activities, fun activities to support children's development, and then um, reminders for appointments. And you can email the doctor. You can take a developmental checklist for your child's specific age and email the doctor or email your grandmother. Um, so it's very comprehensive as in English or Spanish, and this is how you download it. And I'll give one caveat that it is in, still in process with these revisions. So their CDC is also updating all the photos and videos and adding more. So that has not been completed. Um, so if you download it and look at it, it has a lot of good written content, but it doesn't have what I consider that most dynamic feature. So um, you may have to wait a few more months on that, but it, it, it's coming. Okay, this is like the developmental checklist for 18 months. It's like a one pager. You can download it um, online at the CDC site. And this is a more streamlined look now and uh, has more social emotional milestones. That's something each developmental age has more based on these revisions. And then it also has little screening reminders. And here's the 18 month screening for developmental reminder for developmental screening and autism screening. And then these are our uh, older materials, which we still are disseminating. And you can get these delivered to your school um, or if you want them for home visits, if you're a CIS provider, um, you just contact your local maternal and child health coordinator. And if you need to figure out who that is, please, you can just email this um, registry email uh, or you can email me and my emails at the end of the PowerPoint. We have a new board book for babies from CDC. It's really cute. And this is our Help Me Grow Rack card that gives information for families on how to contact us. We um, did a pretty large project translating materials. Again, this is the older brochure with that older look, but we do have um, Vermont translations in nine languages and they're on the Vermont Family Network site. Um, if folks are working with um, families who are speaking other languages. Okay, so let's dig in a little bit to these milestone revisions. So developmental monitoring, we talked about it really helps with early identification and kind of that upstream protective factor, if you will. It's really increasing early childhood understanding among parents, families, caregivers, and um, developmental promotion. So just promoting healthy development, um, celebrating milestones, really understanding what emerging skills are taking place, how to promote those skills and support them with learning activities, or um, and then again, building that family relationship um, and trusting relationships with providers. It's a lot easier when we train childcare providers. We talk a lot about if you're having regular conversations about a child's development with families, it's so much easier to talk about if you have a concern or if something needs a little extra nudge, like speech development, right? Like often needs a little bit of extra support, um, with some targeted <clears throat> strategies or some sign language or what whatnot. It's so much easier to talk about that if all along you've been talking about that child's development from the time they were born. So, and in Vermont, we really promote screening in this larger context that it's not just about the child's development, it's about the child's environment. It's about the family environment, those social conditions that impact health, social determinants of health um, and health equity. And by helping parents understand social and emotional or all, all kinds of different domains of development, we're really putting them in the driver's seat so that they can advocate for their child. They can reach out and get extra support. They can more effectively take a developmental screen or talk to their child's pediatrician um, and also um, predict what's coming. Because it's so hard as parents, right? When everything changes, in a child's development, it's something new and it throws you off. And if, if you understand a little bit more that there are these periods of development, what's to come and what's a child working on, it can really strengthen that um, parent-child relationship and, and overall mental health. I, I wanna bring your attention to this really cool new uh, toolkit, if you will. It's the, called a Roadmap for Advancing Family-Engaged Developmental Monitoring. It was developed by the Help Me Grow National Center and the uh, Associated Center uh, for uh, University 
Disabilities, uh, getting that name wrong, I always get that wrong. <laughs> um, but they're great partners. And um, there were two folks from Vermont, myself included, on the on the team to give input um, and help develop this roadmap. Um, but it's wonderful. And it's very family-centered, very much focused on equity, putting families in the driver's seat and talking about what's going well with development and really taking into account environmental and risk factors um, so that we're helping families get what they need so they can do the best job for this, this their developing child. Um, so please, please check that out. Um, okay, so why did CDC decide to re revise these milestones? Well, they've been used for over 15 years with lots of feedback from lots of types of professional groups from provider groups. Uh, a couple age groups and checklists were missing the 15 and 30 month. There was some pretty vague language like may begin to do this. Um, there was, uh, there were like a checkbox of milestones that might have been missing, kind of red flags, if you will, but how many before it was really a concern that should be acted on. Um, and the original milestones were things that most children should do, and that's like about 50%. And now these have been revised so that over 75% of children should be doing the new the new milestones that are that have been published. So that makes it much more difficult to, to wait, have that wait and see approach. If over, only over 50% of kids are doing it, you might say, well, this child is just a little slow. But if 75% of kids are doing it and this, uh, this child isn't, then we probably should do something about it. So this was the developmental expertise that went into the revisions. You can see it's a very diverse group of folks with a parent representative, um, SLPs, general pediatrician, a lot of practicing folks. And these were the criteria that they developed to really revise the older milestones against. They included open-ended questions, which I think is wonderful. It's, they, part of it, the milestones now are asking the parent, do you have any concerns? What are you most worried about? Things like that. Um, they got rid of warning signs, made it much easier for families with different social, cultural, and ethnic backgrounds. So they widened the field of who they feel they field tested these things with in terms of cultures and languages spoken. And um, let's see, real plain language, no jargon, five to seventh grade reading level, family friendly. Again, different education levels, income levels, and racial groups that these were tested with. So uh, just additional features, again, the open-ended questions um, and that a lot more tips and activities for um, learning or for early promoting early development, including that social, emotional, and early relational health, um, which is so important. Okay, so here's some of the open-ended questions. Uh, is there anything your child does or does not do that concerns you? And has your child lost any skills he or she once had? And those two questions really encompass all the warning signs that were in the previous iteration of milestones. So much more simple. If the child is losing skills, we always want to, we're always concerned about that, right? Um, but that parents really know, this is really honoring that parents know that the parents have concerns and we need to really listen to those concerns. Um, and then also any um, premature or special health care needs. Okay, if you want to know more about the revisions, there's an article um, here, a link to the article about the revision process, and then Help Me Grow National compiled a bunch of materials on their website that's really helpful in understanding um, the, the process and the utility of it, and I'll recommend that as well. I think I'm happy to take questions now, or you could put them in the chat, or we could wait till the end. Um, and Cooper, my colleague here from Help Me Grow is gonna tell you a little bit about Help Me Grow as again, part of that system here for monitoring, screening, and connecting to services like, like the services you all provide. Yeah, thank you, Janet. Um, so um, my name is Cooper. I'm the program manager at Help Me Grow Vermont. Um, so I work in Help Me Grow Vermont's resource hub. Um, and I'm going to shift gears a little bit today. Um, well, just now. 
Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about Help Me Grow Vermont um, and how we um, we support families throughout the state um, and the resources that we can offer um, to some of your families. So, um, you know, our vision is really um, Help Me Grow as the one-stop shop um, for connecting families to services and supports throughout the state. Um, Everyone has probably heard that phrase, children are future. I know, is it really corny to bring that up in a presentation? Absolutely. But <laughs> the reason why I do so is because I think it really um, is at the core of how Help Me Grow sees the system. Um, we know that capable children help build a foundation for a prosperous and sustainable society. Um, so our hope is by focusing on the specific early childhood age group um, that we can have this much larger societal impact. And I think it's really important to kind of center that as we're thinking about what Help Me Grow can do to offer your families. Um, this work is really based in the science of brain architecture. Um, we know that these early years of a child's life are incredibly, incredibly impactful on future development. Um, and we also know that emotion and cognition are actually these two really profoundly interrelated processes. Um, so what that means is that for children, having these, these strong, nurturing, consistent relationships in early childhood become that much more important. Um, so, you know, it's, <laughs> excuse me, sorry, news in the background. Um, so, you know, obviously, as we're all aware, not all children um, have positive, you know, positive experiences in early childhood. Um, that's just a fact, right? Whether it's poverty or food insecurity or things like trauma, isolation, um, there's some really big important factors that lead to chronic stress in households. Um, and what we know is that they, you know, this chronic stress can wreak havoc on family functioning, um, and it's a disruption to early development. Um, and so I think this is really where developmental screening comes in. And I know Janet talked a little bit about that in her in her start of the PowerPoint. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more later about um, our specific developmental screening work. Um, but when we think about developmental screening, you know, I think the importance is really that these are family led tools um, where we get we're getting that family engagement. Families are learning about their child's development. They're learning positive parenting techniques um, and they're becoming a part of that conversation, a part of that process um, and making sure that they have the tools that they need to support their child. Um, so. <laughs> Moving on here. So um, who does Help Me Grow Vermont serve? Um, so the answer to that is really easy. It's any family in Vermont with children under age eight um, or or anyone who is pregnant, anyone who is expecting. Um, this is a free service. Um, and as I mentioned, there's no eligibility criteria outside of children in that age group. Um, so I think that's a really important piece. Um, for providers, we welcome you to refer directly to us. We have a referral form that's linked right here on this slide. Um, it's also really readily available on our website. Um, and so if you have families who might need a little extra support, um, whether that's getting, getting connected to one of these resources on the screen here or something else, we're really happy to help support you um, and help support your families. Um, when we receive a referral, we do our best to respond within the next business day. Uh, so that's the amount of time between the time we receive the referral and the amount of time we reach out to the family um, in. And then um, and we, we try to help get families connected to all different types of resources, um, as I mentioned. So um, just some of the examples, perinatal support and treatment and resources. Um, children's integrated services, so that's maybe connection to early intervention, um, maybe a family is looking for connection to home visiting, um, treatments and supports around substance use disorder, developmental screening, child care, um, and all sorts of basic needs resources, um, including food, housing, etc. So um, there's a wide range of needs, and a lot of them um, are often overlapping, as I'm sure people know from their experience. Um, Besides referrals, we also do take calls, texts, and emails, so people reach out to us directly. Um, and we take calls not only from the families themselves, but we do also um, receive calls from providers. So sometimes maybe you have a, a client 
uh, on your, you know, who you're dealing with, who you're not sure if they'll really follow up with the referral process um, or that they'd want to engage with that, but you want to get a little more information to be able to support them with. So maybe you give us a call and talk through that situation a little bit, and we'll try to, to help kind of um, provide those resources to you so you can support that family. So we're, we try to be really, really flexible. We know every family is different, um, and we know that often families have a lot going on. So we want to make that, that process really easy for them. Um, a really important part of our process is that follow-up process. So every single person that we talk to um, is going to be offered a follow-up. Um, and so that's a really big part of our work. Actually, in 2022, um, we had almost double the amount of outgoing calls from our resource hub as we did incoming calls. So increasingly, that's becoming more and more um, where we're devoting our resources um, as a staff, just because the, most people do tend to want to follow up, just from my, my anecdotal experience. Um, that's, I think, a really vital part of this system. Um, and if you refer to us, one of the beauties is that we will also include you in that follow-up process. So this is kind of what that's talking about here. Um, whether we get connected to a family and we're able to help support them, whether we get connected to a family and there's still some challenges, or whether we just weren't able to reach them whatsoever, we're going to keep you a part of that process. We're going to loop you in, give you a call, let you know, hey, here's here's what happened. Here's what where we're stuck or um, haven't been able to get through to the family. Um, and that allows like you to do your job so much better, right? Next time you have contact with that family, you can tell them, hey, I talked to someone that helped me grow and here's what they said. Um, and I think, you know, we know that all the, a lot of these systems are very challenging, um, especially for someone who's never maybe engaged with them for the first time. And so having as many supports and as many people who can um, have that inside information of being like, oh, did you get through to, in, to children's degraded services? And um, have you set up an evaluation? Like some of that language is really helpful to be equipped with um, so that you can help equip the family um, for those processes. Um, so a little bit about how we meet the need. Um, one of the things that's really cool um, is that we partner with Vermont 2 and one um, They're a very close partner of ours and we have a shared database of resources with them. Um, so we any resource that a family would, uh, that an individual might get connected to through the two, yeah, connected to through 211, excuse me, um, they can also get connected to through us. Um, that's a huge, huge help. We're really thankful for that partnership. Um, and we also do have a kind of help me grow specific um, database as well. So some very um, specialized resources, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, all in all, we have over 3000 resources um, in our database. So that's a lot of information at our disposal. Um, we when we talk to families, um, we do our best to kind of get to the root of the need, um, so get to the bottom of what they're dealing with, um, and we're trying to find resources um, that meet the complexity of a client's need. Um, and sometimes it's it's multiple things. Um, so, you know, one example is I had a, um, a family, well, a, it was a single mom who reached out to me back in late fall. Um, she reached out to our, our resource hub and she was, she had just moved to Vermont um, with her daughter and she was trying to get figure out where to get some help for Christmas because the, the holidays are right around the corner. Um, and as I said, she had just moved here. So she was kind of still trying to figure out the systems. Um, and as we were talking, you know, it became clear that there are some other things that she was also trying to figure out, you know, she was struggling with figuring out where to get personal care items. Um, that's one that, you know, for those who know, like, can be kind of hidden in certain programs, often you have to find the right food bank and they're dependent on availability. Um, so it can be challenging, especially if you you don't, you, you're, you're just new to the state, you don't have uh, these pre existing relationships. Um, so that was one thing that we kind of helped her try to get connected with. Um, and then also, as we were talking over time, um, she let us know that there were some behavioral challenges with her daughter that she was kind of struggling with um, and was needed a little support with. Um, so we ended up offering um, that she do a, a social emotional screen on the ASQ online, which she did um, with her daughter. And after we, we received those results um, and, and reviewed them and we gave her a call back. And so we ended up um, doing a referral to essential early education with the family so that they could get connected with the supports through their school district. 
Um, and the one really nice thing about the follow-up process is we were able to follow along as that process evolved um, and able to provide support um, as they, that was unfolding. So that was really awesome. Um, and I think, you know, one reason I bring up that story is just because for every family, the way that we support them is super, super different. Um, so, you know, there may be a family where just one call and all of those needs are are all like identified the first thing. Um, and it may be several calls. Um, and, you know, most of the time there's more than one overlapping need. Um, and we're going to do our best to try to get to the, the bottom of that. So um, that's kind of a little bit about how we're how we're striving to meet that need. Um, so here's a little bit about um, the support delivered campaign. Now, the support delivered campaign um, is one of the health departments um, campaigns from 2022. I think it was launched in April of last year. Um, and it's a way that we're partnering um, together um, as a way to offer supports um, to new and expecting parents um, related to, to perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. Um, we often think about it as also postpartum anxiety and depression. Um, so um, through this work, um, the health department on their website has a um, a web form submission where folks can go in and they can um, request um, to get in contact with Help Me Grow Vermont, ask very basic information, name, town, and a means of contact. Um, and then we will reach out directly. It comes directly into our email inbox and we'll reach out um, and see how we can support them with that, with that kind of um, treatment. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, Help Me Grow has some very specific um, resources in our database. A lot of those are um, are related to perinatal mood anxiety disorder. We have um, a, a wealth of therapists who specialize in this time period um, that we have in our database. So um, if folks are, are wanting to get connected with a therapist, we can help with that. Um, we also have support groups that focus on perinatal mood, perinatal period, excuse me, um, and we'll help them get connected to other, um, you know, broader resources. So for example, Postpartum Support International has a whole host of resources. So um, a lot of different options, depending on what the family is going through and what they're looking for. And I always just like to flag for this. Um, it's not just necessarily the birthing parent. Um, there's also, um, we work with non-birthing parents as well. Um, really anyone who's struggling in that, that prenatal and postnatal period is welcome to, um, to get connected with us. Um, so that's a little bit on that. Um, and then another big piece of our work that I always like to flag for people is our, our work with Children's Integrated Services. Um, one of the things we do a lot um, is help get families connected with CIS, with Children's Integrated Services. Um, and, you know, we know that often families have this kind of complex array of needs. Um, and we also know that it's really natural as a parent to have some developmental concerns, right? It's, you know, I think Jana was getting to it earlier. It's a scary time sometimes. And if you don't have that knowledge, um, or if you don't know to predict, to, to expect some of those changes, um, it can be scary. And so what we try to do is whenever there are concerns um, that a family brings up about their child um, and how they're developing, we're going to try to arm them um, with that support, with that knowledge. Um, if there needs to be next steps that need to happen, we're going to help get them connected to those. Um, and whether that's, you know, a referral directly to Children's Integrated Services, whether they're they're needing just to start with like a developmental screening, we're going to try to help meet that need um, and support them through that process. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to hand it back off to Janet. Janet, feel free to, if there's anything I missed, feel free to go ahead and add in um, and, uh, and let me know if anyone has questions. <laughs> uh, that was awesome. Thank you, Cooper. Yeah, uh, I think part of our quality improvement work is trying to build a stronger connection to CIS programs and particularly focusing on um, referring to home visiting programs and every family deserves a home visitor right and it's um it's a nice time to have that extra support and really normalizing that for families and um offering a person to come to their home and building that connection between the telephone support telephone care coordination help me grow offers and the real person in the community who can come in and continue the screening referring and connecting to resource work um, that's so important okay so I'm just gonna finish us up here with a little data about Help Me Grow. Um, we have a new 
report card right here is this link. Uh, please check it out. It's um, a lot of work that happened during the pandemic. Uh, and uh, we're a little bit a year in arrears with our data because of the pandemic. But um, there's some some pretty significant work that was done. Here is a graph on the calls and referrals that we received. Um, you can see that we referred we, we received about over 3,000 calls and referrals and we made over 4,000 referrals and almost as many um, ongoing calls or follow-up calls as incoming calls. So there's a lot of care coordination going on at Help Me Grow, a lot of following up with families and that's where we often build that relationship and kind of uncover additional needs. And then the smaller subsets are families that share demographic information, their child becomes um, kind of a client in our system, if you will. And those families can come in and out at different periods. Sometimes we don't hear from them for months and they come back and, um, but some of these other callers can remain anonymous. So that's why you see sort of, a, sort of a large change in that data there. Okay, so these are some of the common reasons families contact us. And you can see the number one reason is basic needs. Um, and that part of that is also our relationship with Vermont 211 that um, any caller that calls them, they will refer straight to Help Me Grow because of that um, really intense level of care coordination, the follow-up that we can offer that 211 does not offer, don't have the capacity to offer. So um, we've been we've been kind of really expanding their service for the prenatal to age eight population for a number of years now. Um, and then you can see we had a lot of income support and employment um, work and referrals that happened again, that was during the pandemic, even criminal justice and legal services, things like family court, economic appeals, um, and then individual and family wellness. And that's a lot of the developmental resources, um, referrals to CIS, um, parenting hotlines, the perinatal um, and anxiety work fall under that bucket. And um, you can see that although the reasons for calling Help Me Grow, like this basic need category has remained consistent over time, we have really increased our referrals for perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. And we made over 230 referrals on behalf of 57 individuals um, in 2020 and 21. And uh, we received 63 total contacts for PMANS. That's referrals, calls, emails, texts, um, and provided 290 seven referrals and I believe that's in 2022. Yeah, so we're increasing that work and really proud of it. And I um, encourage you all, if you're working with someone who's who's suffering from anxiety or depression to connect either you directly as the provider, talk to Help Me Grow about resources that you may not be aware of. And we're happy to share anything we know of that you can directly connect the family to and or refer the family to us. And Cooper shared some success stories, but these are, again, just some of the general ways that we help families um, really that navigating complex systems of care um, and that we're just kind of a safety belt there to help with anything. So if there are any questions in the work you're doing with families, please call Cooper and ask her, um, you know, you can be not, you can keep the family anonymous and just find out um, if you need help understanding these systems that can be really difficult. To, come, to navigate, especially if folks are involved in child welfare systems or um, it's, it just can get really complicated. Okay, this is some of our work that we've done with training early care and education providers and others. Uh, during the pandemic, we were able to continue training uh, over 400 folks here, healthcare, early care edu educators, community providers, home visitors to conduct developmental and social emotional screening and to refer families for further evaluation and or services. And so that means that uh, today there's over 9,000 children in childcare programs that have received our training. Um, this includes over 2,000 preschoolers heading off to kindergarten better prepared to learn and succeed. We know that if folks, if families and children are in programs that have received Help Me Grow training, whether it's pre-K or a home-based childcare provider, those kids are better off developmentally and those families are better prepared for their school, their child to thrive in school. Um, and so that's almost enough children to fill half of Vermont's kindergarten classrooms. So we're very proud of that data. 
Okay, so Help Me Grow offers the ages and stages online system for the state of Vermont free of charge to any provider screening. So if any of you use the ASQ, SE, or three, please email Cooper and we can give you access to this online system, which is very dynamic, robust, it has multiple reporting features. It also has the, the learning activities that correspond with each screening tool, age, and each domain that you can download as a PDF and mail email to the family after a visit. It gets rid of those big paper books um, that people were Xeroxing pages out of. So um, it's a really nice way to follow up after a screening with those learning activities, or if a child is in the monitoring zone on, on one domain or two domains, you can give activities like speech activities or motor gross motor activities to families to help encourage that skill to progress by the before the next screen. Um, so again, please reach out and contact us. We're really excited to get more programs using this um, system. And this is the programs that we have currently using. You can see the majority here in the blue are early care and education providers. And then the next um, large sector is medical practices. And we have, um, I think, six strong family home health agency sites now using the, the ASQ online. And we have, I think, two and maybe soon to be three, three, three CIS three. teams using, which is super exciting. Um, and the really exciting part of this, so, so each program has their own uh, access to the ASQ in a programmatic context. So like a school district could have um, screens and share them across you know, pre-K programs within the district, but they wouldn't share screening results with like the home health agency or the medical practice in their town, right? But all this data in the ASQ online is going to be fed into Vermont's Universal Developmental Screening Registry. And I, I know some of you on this call probably know about the registry and know when we launched it. And um, we're really excited that we have this more robust, user-friendly, really intuitive ASQ system with a lot more features than our registry offers. And our registry is part of our immunization registry here at the health department. If folks are aware of that, we have vital records, we have metabolic screening results, hearing results, lead results, and now we have developmental screening results. Um, and so we have over 13,000 screens, I think, in the ASQ online, and our IT is just beginning to complete this data bridge that they were in the process of building, got interrupted by COVID. So, Stay tuned later this summer and fall, and um, you will be able to look up a child's screening history or screening results before you screen a child in our registry. And hopefully there'll be somebody else who screened that child that, that you may be able to reference to help in your own work. So stay tuned for more on that. All right, and now it's time for questions. And I wonder if I should, um, also I'll just say that our last slide has both Cooper and my email on it so you can contact us and you all have the slides. I think they're emailed to you, but maybe I'll stop sharing my screen so I can see people better. That's okay. And I also put in the chat for folks, um, Help Me Grow's general email inbox, um, just if anyone is interested in ASQ online or anything else. Um, so feel free to reach out to us.